Welcome back to the International Commission podcast. This is episode 23 of our new podcast format. And on this show, we talk about mission stories. We talk about sharing the gospel in different ways with different people. We rank some of our favorite and least favorite things from around the world. Tell funny, weird, inspiring stories and all sorts of things in between. And today we have a very special episode with a fun new guest who just went on a mission trip with us for the first time. I'm Bucky Elliott, the media director here at International Commission. My co-host today is Allison Carr. Hey, Allie Carr here. I'm the director of special projects at International Commission, and I help with our marketing, our fundraising events, as well as my favorite part of my job, which is training, training people and equipping and enabling them to share the gospel and make disciples. You heard Allie on a previous episode, or I hope you did, telling some crazy stories from travel. And she's our co-host today, A, because she's awesome, and B, (laughs) because Brooke is out. Why is Brooke out? Brooke just had a baby, so she has good reason to be out. (laughs) Very excused absence. (laughs) Yes. So you won't you won't hear Brooke for a little while. while. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have uh, a bunch of other staff members and special guests on in the next few weeks here. But our most important guest today is Chloe Baker. Hi. How are (laughs) y'all? Hi. We're doing good. Thank you so much for coming on, Allie. Tell us about today's episode. Yeah. So today on the show, we have two segments. The first segment is story time with Chloe. And she'll tell us about her recent mission trip with us at IC in Zimbabwe, which was her very first mission trip ever and her first time leading people to Christ. And then in our second segment, it's called Did You Know? So in this segment, we'll be talking about International Commission's results and stats from last year in 2023 and what has happened so far this year. So we'll dig into that a little bit more. All right, let's go. Let's do this. It's story time. All right, Chloe. So first tell us and tell everyone, how did you hear about International Commission in general? And then how did you hear about this trip specifically? Um, so International Commission, I actually, I didn't realize it, but I heard about them or y'all a couple of years ago when, cause my old church was Indian Creek and Mineral Wells and my pastor stepped down from preaching and said how he was going to enter in um, international commissions and stuff like that. And so that's kind of, I guess, the first time I heard about it. When I heard about this trip was at church, my hometown church, and my pastor um, brought up that they were going on a mission trip to Zimbabwe, and I've always wanted to go on one, and I never, all the other ones that I was supposed to never really worked out. So I was like, you know what, we're going to do it. So um, I went for it. Oh, that's awesome. So you said your hometown. Are you from Mineral Wells? Yes. Okay. So for those of you who don't know where that is or have never heard of that before, that is in Texas. Mm-hmm. IC's headquarters is located in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and Mineral Wells is probably like, I don't know, an hour and 40 minutes. Like west, yeah. West up here. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're Texas neighbors here. And is that Guy Weathers that you're talking about? Your pastor? Yes. Oh, yes. Awesome. Yeah, I've traveled with him before too. Amazing. Yeah, I know him and his wife pretty well. So, <laughs> Oh, she's awesome too. Yeah, I love Nancy. <laughs> so did Zimbabwe stick out to you as a place that you really wanted to go? Um, you know, did you want to go to Africa in general or was there another place in the world you would have preferred to go? Or was it just like, like you said, you've always wanted to go on a mission trip and this was an opportunity that presented itself and you're like, okay, I guess I'll go to Zimbabwe. Yeah, it was, it was kind of that one. I just, um, I never had a specific place in mind that I really wanted to go. I just always wanted to go on one and he said Zimbabwe and I was like, you know what, we're going to, we're going to do it. So that's adventurous. Love that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Did you know where Zimbabwe was on a map of Africa? Probably not. I do have actually a friend from Zimbabwe. So I knew about kind of Zimbabwe and I, um, cause I played tennis with weather or at Weatherford last semester and I had won 
a friend that played tennis as well and she was from Zimbabwe and so I um it was it's kind of funny because I I remember like asking her questions yeah. and I was interested in like her the, her culture and her life over there and then I ended up going on a mission trip there so that was kind of that is kind of cool there so yeah that little connection yeah, yeah. god knew that <laughs> was gonna yeah. happen yeah had you ever left the U.S. before this trip no I was supposed to my sophomore year of high school and go to Guatemala mm -hmm. but with my church but COVID mm -hmm. um happened so because mm -hmm. I was 2020 so but yeah. Wow. So from the U.S. to Zimbabwe for your first international adventure. <laughs> yes. That's a pretty big leap. Yeah. Yes, definitely. What What is it about missions just in the first place that drew you to want to do that? Um, Just because I've always wanted to travel anyways. And so I was like, you know what? Traveling and sharing the gospel, like what's better than that? And so getting to see the world while sharing the good news and just, so I've always, I've always had an interest in it and yeah, it was such a cool experience, but yeah. Just so, so you know, Chloe, that really is the best way to see the world is yes. to travel to all nations and share the gospel. It is really the most joyful way to experience the world and God's creation and all the beautiful people that God has created. Yes. Yeah. I totally agree. <laughs> so just just for me, I, I do love to travel. I grew up traveling. Uh, I was blessed to be an army kid and just get to see different cultures and places and history and experience the food and music and art and everything. But these days, I I would really much rather avoid anything touristy. And I would rather be with local people really in their lives, in their homes, in their workplaces, experiencing really the day-to-day -day culture. And I'd much rather do that than any kind of touristy thing any day. But especially when I'm there in partnership with the Lord and with other Christians, uh, feeling that that family bond, that's just immediate and serving the Lord and seeing him touch my life and touch other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Is absolutely the best way to travel. Yeah, and yeah, even like the the group of, that I went with, all the because I think there was twenty five total American missionaries, and they were amazing, and they knew how nervous I was going mm -hmm. into it, and so they just they were such an amazing group, and they helped me grow so much within that week. So, how many of them were from your church? Three. Okay. Three or four. So the yeah, rest of them were just from different parts of the country? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So what was, what, maybe what was the thing that you were the most nervous about before going? Before going, just, I was really nervous that I wasn't going to be spiritually like ready. And just because it's really nerve wracking going up to someone and talking about God and especially in America, like it's a lot different. And then, but when, when I went, it was so crazy and amazing to see how willing every, everyone was. I think we only had a couple people. I think there was like one or two people that um, I talked to that didn't really want to hear about it, but like almost everyone wanted to hear about Jesus um, and hear what we had to say. So, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, that probably made you feel really good and help put some of your nerves at ease. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. just having that experience of people wanting to hear and being open to listening and meeting you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It made it so much easier. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is actually a lot easier than you think so yeah but yeah so before americans go on a trip with us they are taught many different types of evangelistic tools you know we want people to feel equipped and and know how to share the gospel in different ways and there's not one right perfect way to share the gospel but we want to give people a variety of tools and say hey just use what works for you what you like what might be culturally appropriate in this situation so chloe what tool did you find the most helpful in sharing the gospel um, the Avanti Cube was really helpful, especially being like 
the, that being my first time. And also when we did it, we had people after be like, oh, okay, yeah, using that, I understood. And so, cause they were able to see the pictures and stuff. And so I used that one and also just like sharing my testimony with people and explaining how it was for me before God and after. And so, yeah, just the Avanti cube was a main one though. So. Yay. That is a really great tool. A very popular one for overseas. Um, for those of you who don't know what the Avanja Cube is, you can Google it, you can see a picture of it. Um, but essentially when I first saw it, I thought it was like a kind of Rubik's Cube. Yeah, like that's, a puzzle that's what it looks like, almost like a Rubik's Cube. But it's really neat because it opens up and it really does share the story of Jesus and who we are as sinners and what God did for us. So yeah, that's one of the tools that we teach all of our participants who go. Um, we give them a couple as they go, and then we ask them to teach it to the local pastors, to the church members there, and then leave the Evangelical with them so that after the American team leaves, they are now equipped and know how to share using that tool, and they can keep going. I've always been amazed just how much local people love it mm -hmm. when we've used it during the week. And... Uh, I always hand mine off. That's really the intent. We mm -hmm. send each participant a couple of Vanja cubes and uh, whoever I'm working with that kind of, it catches their eye and they realize, you know, I, wow, what a great tool. When I hand those over to the local people that I've been working with, they're always so grateful. I've even had people yeah. cry in, yeah. um, because I, I think it's, it's less about the tool itself and more about the fact that it has helped mm -hmm. people share the gospel more confidently and easily yeah. and they just they just see that i you know i can do this mm -hmm. and i can i can share jesus and it's not that complicated and uh, they just they just love that yeah so yeah tell me about that chloe what what was it like sharing the gospel those first few times did, mm -hmm. and did anything surprise you about it yeah uh so what was surprising i would have to say was again how easy it was and so the first time i shared the gospel with someone was this lady and she had like the baby on her back and in in zimbabwe you know they uh they have like a cloth and tie the baby around them and mm -hmm. um uh, I thought that was pretty cool. So, but she, um, we went to her and we were talking to her and she didn't speak English, but, um, I shared it with her and my, my partner kind of gave me a little push to do that. And so, um, I was very glad because then after I was like, oh my gosh, that was really easy. And then after he sent me like, I think he knew, or I know God knew that I was very confident in myself at like that moment. And so literally like right after that he gave me like three people to talk to and the first one she got saved the second one was um this older lady and she was watching me talk to her at the time and at the to this other lady and i was like okay i need to make sure i go and talk to her because she's really interested in what i'm saying and um our pastor that we were with the church that we paired with over there um went to her and saw that she was interested. And so he started kind of talking to her and then I got done and I went to her and I started asking her about Jesus and if she knew him. And she was like, one sec, one sec. And I was like, oh gosh, I was like a little nervous. And she took my hand and she went um, to this one spot she had and like sat me down on this chair and she sat right in front of me and she was so engaged and so ready to listen. And so I did the cube with her and oh my gosh, her joy was, it was so cool. And she was so happy and it was just so cool to see. And so she, um, she accepted Christ and that was one of my favorite experiences. I would have to say just because of the joy she had from hearing the story. So uh, yes, that makes the whole trip worth it. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And that was the first day. Yeah. Oh. Even if just having one of those experiences, like yeah. it was worth it. Oh um, yeah. 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 So, it was so cool. I was so like, I mean, I felt it was so rewarding and like the fact that he chose me to be a part of that moment. Yeah. So, yeah. So having this experience, um, 
you know, you said you went in really nervous to share your faith and look how God used you even in your feelings of weakness um, to give you strength and courage to share the gospel. Now, on the other side, you've had this experience. You're back in the United States. How are you feeling now? And how are you going to use that experience where you are today in Fort Worth, Texas, in Mineral Wells, Texas? Yeah. So, um, because yeah, we talked about that when we were in Zimbabwe and I was, and I said, I was like, it's just so cool how easy it is here. And I was like, I wish it was in like back home, but like, honestly going to Zimbabwe and like, we literally just walked around the streets sharing the gospel. And it was like, why, why can't we do that at home? And so, um, it, even though it's more frightening because it is people are probably going to be more denying of it or not want to hear it as much. But I try to look for those moments where I can. And even like with my coworkers, um, I try to talk about it as much because I'm like, I want to apply that here because I don't want to just go off to another country, do it there and be done. And so um, I was really motivated when I got back. And so just trying to bring it up every single time and um, get a chance if I can. So, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What's your best, what's your best method for kind of transitioning a, a regular conversation toward a, a gospel conversation? A lot here is with like my coworkers. I it's mainly though, cause I work with all girls and they're around my age. And so they'll be talking about like, um, boys and guys and stuff. And so, um, basically like about that whole thing and what they look for. And so I'll be like, well, I look for a man of God. And so um, I kind of transition that into it. And it's still nerve wracking because you are like, you work with them every day, but I try to bring that in and I'll be like, well, this is what I look for. Cause I'm every day I'm in my Bible and, and I'm doing this and um, so I want my husband to do that, my future husband. And so like, I kind of use it that way right now because it's still nervous, but I'm trying to get over, you know, the nervousness still. So that's yeah, great. Yeah. Well, the more you practice, the easier it gets. And I'm sure you had that experience in Zimbabwe because you're doing it all day, every day and you feel a lot more confident and okay. Like, you know, I, I yeah. feel better about sharing and, and approaching the gospel in different ways. So yeah, don't lose that enthusiasm and motivation. What you're doing is great. Just whatever you can to bridge that gap. And God is the most important thing in your life. So of course, you're going to bring him up when you're talking about relationships or how you spend your day or your hobbies yeah. and interests. Yeah. So yeah, keep that up. You're doing a great job. And you've got an opportunity now also to share your stories about Zimbabwe. If people know that you mm -hmm. went there mm -hmm. and maybe they ask about it, or maybe you can kind of sprinkle in a, a story or a, a, a little <laughs> comment once in a while about Zimbabwe and maybe sure. open that door to explain to people why you went and what happened there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've definitely been talking about it as Anytime I can, I'll be like, yeah, and this happened. And then I'll tell stories and how it's so cool that this happened and this related and to this. And so, um, yeah, it's so cool. I'm, yeah, I talk about it anytime I can because mm -hmm. it's just such a rewarding and such a cool experience. So, uh, would you do this again? Oh, yeah, I, I plan to. Oh, Yay. Okay. Yeah. Hope you <laughs> yeah. go with us again. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, I definitely plan to. Awesome. All right, Chloe, let me ask you a fun question. Since this was your first time out of the United States and in Africa, did you have any interesting food experiences? Oh yeah. I um so their traditional meal is called called sadza and it kind of looks like mashed potatoes. And I'm already a picky eater. So <laughs> um uh I went way out of my comfort zone, but um, I tried it actually on the first night that we were at the hotel, my roommate who was actually from my church. So I've known her for years, but she was like, Chloe, try this. And I was like, Oh gosh. And so she was telling me about how it's like their traditional meal. And so I tried it. I was, I was not a fan. Um, and so when we were out with our, um, the pastor in the church that we were, uh, 
paired with that week, every each day that we were out, they provided our lunch for us, and they uh, they wanted me to try sadza, and I was like, I've already tried it, and so, but that's uh, that's one, and then I don't know if this is a normal thing, and I don't think it's a normal thing in Texas, especially a uh, goat. Have y'all read goat? Not normal. And to, oh, I've had lots of goat, but not here. <laughs> okay, yeah. I was like, it shouldn't be. But yeah, they asked me if I wanted goat. And I was like, I'm sorry, I can't Aww. do that. <laughs> so, but I tried, I tried to try other things. So, but, but yeah. Good for you. Yeah, way to try it. Yeah, food yeah. can definitely be yeah. an experience traveling internationally. You know, we have our comfort foods. We like what we like. And if you have like dietary restrictions or preferences or allergies, it can definitely be difficult. A lot of people will just bring their, their own snacks, mm -hmm. whether it's protein mm -hmm. bars or, you know, pretzels or whatever. Um, if, if they have a lot of challenges with food, they'll bring a lot of snacks with them on the mission field. But it's also difficult because food like unites people. And so you don't want to be offensive to people. Yeah. But I'm glad that you were willing to try, even though you knew that you're a picky eater and this is going to make me nervous, but mm -hmm. you know, at least you tried. And now you can say, I don't really like that. I tried it. And yeah, you know, yeah. Cause I, uh, yeah, I brought snacks as well too. Cause my, my, my parents knew also they were like, Chloe, you need to bring snacks. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. So I brought some of that and then, yeah, I was kind of I wasn't sure how they were if you got like, cause I didn't want to offend, like you said, I didn't want to offend anyone. So I tried to eat as much as I could. And so I think I did pretty good for being a picky eater. <laughs> nice. Nice. I've found that especially in this scenario where we're working with other Christians who are hosting us, they're, they're aware that we're from a totally different place and might have different diet and things like that. And so yeah, we want to be really respectful and, tr you know, try things like you did. But they're, they understand if you don't like something or if you've brought your own food. I've never really had anybody that seemed upset by it. But I do, I still try to be a little discreet. Like if I'm in a granola bar or whatever, I'll try to try to do it, you know, not showing off. Yeah. Uh, try to do it on the car ride or sneak off for a minute or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So when we go on these trips and we're sharing the gospel and we are outside of our comfort zone and we gain the confidence from seeing God work, really that's all due to the fact that really we're partnering with the Lord. And when we see God changing lives and we're sharing the gospel, we begin to understand that really it's not us. Like it really doesn't have anything to do with us or our skill level or our eloquence. It's just our availability whether we're willing to mm -hmm. go and obey God and submit to what he's, what he's leading us to do and who to talk to and recognizing like you did, Chloe, those opportunities that he puts in our way, the people, the specific people that he brings across our path, that's all up to him. And so with that in mind, we see God working all over the world in so many different ways. And just because ordinary people who believe and follow Jesus step up and say, yes, I'll be there. I'll go. We get to see really amazing things happen. That's right. So that's going to lead us to our next segment. Y'all like that segue? Love it. Leads us to our next <laughs> segment about results and stats and just giving you a report of mm -hmm. some of those things that God has done in the past year and uh, this year. Did you know? So just a little preface into this Did You Know segment. Since the inception of our ministry in 1973, International Commission has kept record, just to the best of our ability, of the results and efforts put forth through all of our evangelistic partnerships and projects. Now, our ministry has grown so much and we're reaching more countries and including more pastors and volunteers and global participants. But it's really cool because as an organization, we really do try our best to keep track of our efforts and how God is working so we can rejoice and praise God for what he's doing around the world. With all that being said, we keep track of things like how many per people heard the gospel and how many churches have been planted because of the influx of new believers in an area or how many countries have been reached in a single year and so on. And 
we don't keep track of any of this to say, look at us, look how great we are and look at what we're doing. But it really is done as a way to keep track in order to bring glory to God for the things that he is doing, not us. Before I jump into the statistics themselves, um, let me give a little, little disclaimer. Only God knows people's hearts. We work for him and we share the gospel and people indicate that they made a profession of faith. And so we record that. But by no means do we claim to have the final authority of knowing exactly whether or not someone did accept Christ or whether or not there were 84 people in a room versus 100 people that we may have estimated to the best of our ability. So just keep that in mind while we do our best to keep record of all of these things. It's more likely than not that the numbers are off, even just a little bit, but only God knows. So here we go. I'm going to start off by sharing IC's results from all of our global work done last year, which was 2023. So here are some numbers for you. In 2023, this is how many people heard the gospel. 6,881,000 people. 6.8 million people heard the gospel in one year <laughs> just one just year from one just our ministry, ministry yeah. that That's that includes our international projects which are our short-term mission trips that we send americans on to partner with churches um it includes our national to national partnerships and our operation andrew partnerships that happened all year every single day of the year we have evangelistic partnerships going on where people are sharing the gospel in their communities in one way or another every single day, which is so encouraging and amazing. So through all of our efforts, 6.8 million people heard the gospel last year. From those 6.8 who have heard from our records, we show that 4,710,300 people have made professions of faith who have accepted Christ. Woo. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> 4.7 million people have accepted Christ last year. Praise God. Praise God. Oh my gosh. Wow. And it's the, those, you know, mostly one on one conversations. Yeah. And with people that have been prayed for and we know can be connected to a local church. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's huge. That's a huge thing considering we don't do like big open air rallies. We don't do you know, really radio broadcast or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's all just people talking to other people. So amazing. From those 4.7 million last year, baptisms, 403,848. So sometimes people will get baptized that same day that they accept Christ. Sometimes it happens a few months later. Sometimes it doesn't happen till you know, a year later or two years later. But from last year alone, we show that 403,848 people got baptized after they accepted Christ. And I think those reports come from, uh, or th those numbers come from a report for like the the, the duration of that partnership uh, mm -hmm. itself. So, well, I guess we can talk about the structure of how a partnership works some other time, but basically yeah. the, the whole thing might be six to nine months or mm -hmm. a year. So that, like Ali was saying earlier, what all really happens from then on, we, we don't know. We're reporting uh, the, the numbers and the names of people that our local uh, coordinators and leaders uh, write down uh, and yeah. send to us. So that's where the, all, all those come from. Yeah. So for example, Chloe, when you went with us in Zimbabwe, either you or your teammate was probably writing down like how many people you shared the gospel with on a given day on monday you know we went to this home shared with five people went to this area shared with two people so the participants are helping us they're literally writing down how many people they spoke to how many people indicated they accepted christ so that's one way that we're able to keep track of those numbers just for those of you who are listening um, I talked about the international partnerships earlier, so I'll just touch on that. Last year, we did send or we did have 14 international partnerships, which is those short-term mission trips we talked about. Um, I also mentioned end-to-ends or national-to-national partnerships. That's where we train and equip 
the local churches in another country to do the evangelistic outreaches on their own. So it's the same structure as an international partnership, just without the team, the American team going to them. They might have people from neighboring countries coming in to help them if the culture and the language is very similar. Um, but we're able to reach a lot more people through our end-to-end -end partnership. So last year we had 436 end-to-end -end partnerships and only 14 international partnerships. So as you can see, we do a lot more equipping and enabling of the international churches than we do of sending teams to those churches, which is which is great because there's no, you know, it cuts costs with the lodging and the airfare and there's not that language barrier all the time. So it really is a more effective way of reaching people through the end-to-end -end partnerships. So through the end-to-end, through -end, so our international partnerships, we worked in 134 countries last year, which is probably more than half of the world, yeah, wouldn't you say? Yeah. yeah, we worked in 134 countries. Now, listen to this, global participants. These are all the people. These are the Americans that go on the trips. These are the pastors we work with, the church members who do the evangelistic outreaches with us. Global participants, 1,693,844. Oh, wow. That's a lot of mobilizations. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Wow. That's Amazing. a lot of getting people up out of the pews and into the streets and into the homes, getting outside the walls and going into the world. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. So the last statistic I want to share is how many new churches were planted because of our evangelistic efforts? This is really crazy because we are not a church planting ministry. We do not claim to be a church planting ministry. That's not our focus. But because of the 4 million, 4. <laughs> yeah. 4.7 million new believers now in these areas, these churches like need to, new churches need to be planted in these areas where the new believers are. So new churches, 23,053. Yeah. So just over 23,000 new churches are planted. Wow. And just thinking about how those those are new churches, uh, in imagine if those multiply the same way, mm -hmm. that's incredible. Yeah, we our our staff member Jeff Chetwood would be here if he was on this episode. Mm -hmm. He'd be going crazy about how that multiplication works. That's his favorite oh, thing. Just yeah. seeing, uh, <laughs> seeing disciples multiply, seeing churches multiply. Just thinking, oh look at the exponential potential of all of that mm -hmm. to reach the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. We could do a whole other podcast episode on the new churches, you know, the church plans, what that looks like. Cause some of them could just be a gathering of six believers in a home mm -hmm. in a village because they are the only believers there. So yeah, it could be as small as that. I mean, we are the body of Christ where two and more are gathered together. So when we say new churches, it could be as, as small as that. And that's what it could look like. But yeah, we could get into that on another episode. Mm -hmm. But those are the statistics from just last year. That's just one year of international commissions work. Chloe, do you have any thoughts, reflections, comments on those numbers that you just heard for the first time? <laughs> yeah, I just think that's... I mean, amazing. The fact that in the millions is crazy and so good. So I think that's so cool. It definitely is crazy. Yeah. I There's feel like, like 15 of us at our headquarters here <laughs> yeah. and a handful of staff around the U.S. But it's just it's mm -hmm. just ordinary people all over the world. How many? How many Truly. Uh, 1.6 million. OK. OK. So that's still a lot. Of that's a lot of people. <laughs> Uh, going and sharing the gospel. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just. Yeah. You know. I mean, you know, praise God. We hear all the time when we share about the ministry we serve at or Chloe, you even saying, I went on a mission trip with International Commission. Most people have not heard of our organization. That's just the the fact of the matter. Um, we've been around for 51 years, but a lot of people still haven't heard of us. So to me, I feel so blessed to serve with a ministry that has such a huge global kingdom building impact on the world as a ministry that not many people have heard about but our footprints on the world and the amount of participants and volunteers we have 1.6 million volunteers and 
participants and church partners, pastors. It's, it's really, really cool. Really it's very awesome. humbling. It very is. Grateful. It's very humbling. And yeah. one thing that the thing, one thing that I really love about that is that, um, you know, it's kind of, a, it's okay if our name isn't known mm-hmm. in all of these, all of these partnerships and then all of this work, because we're working with local churches and those mm-hmm. churches are, their name is known to the yeah. people uh, that they bring to Christ. And I, I love that. I think that's just amazing because that's all of these 4.7 million people that came to Christ just in one year. They need to know the names of the people mm-hmm. that have been sharing with them. They need to know the the church that can care for them. Uh, Cause that's, that's who's going to stay. That's who's there mm-hmm. long term. Mm-hmm. Bucky, you may have already done a podcast on this, so I'm not going to go into it. But Operation Andrew is the resource, the bread and butter, the secret sauce, whatever you mm-hmm. want to call it, to how we're able to reach so many people around the world. If you have not heard of Operation Andrew, um, it needs to be talked about either on a future episode or we have some E&E trainings on it. But that's really people ask us all the time, like, how do you reach that so many people? But that is the primary resource we use in everything we do. That is what we use is, is a resource called Operation Andrew. And it's really incredible. It's so simple, so strategic, and so effective. Chloe, did you learn and can you explain how Operation Andrew works? So, well, actually with um, our church that me and my partner was paired with, um, was not originally a part of Operation okay. Andrew. So it's kind of cool and kind of like amazing to see how God works because, um, so we were originally supposed to pair with a different church. I think it was, it was some kind of cult, I think, or something like that. And then they kind of fell out. And so we had two pastors who knew each other and they came up and they joined last minute on that day. And so we, we met them and then we found out that way before we came, they had been praying for like something like this and um, really wanting, uh, they were just like, they were praying about this. And so um, it's really cool how it came about because yeah, they they um, were not originally a part of it. But the, wow. yeah, the, the amazing things that God did that week was, uh, it was really cool. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Again, if you're available, God can use you. Yeah. That's the coolest thing. Yeah, because I think they they originally, I think they came a while before and were, were going to and asked to be a part. And then somehow they didn't, weren't able to. And then they came that day when we were there and they just like walked up. And we're like, hey, we want to join. And so right. we, they, yeah. So yeah, we were like, come on. God will do it. That's right. Yeah. Even if it's not part of our quote plan, exactly. it was God's yeah. plan all yeah. along. Yeah, it. yeah, definitely. What our, what our plan is, uh, it is really effective. And when uh, people are praying, man, you see God move. And I think mostly you see our own hearts change and soften toward lost people. We see them more. We care about them more. Think about them more. Pray about them more. And we're more motivated to share the gospel with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so Operation Andrew basically is a commitment and a challenge to pray for 10 people that you know that don't know the Lord. And uh, pray for them every day uh, and invest in the relationship. Really, the uh, Operation Andrew came from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. This is what they do with churches when they're preparing for a big crusade. Um, mm-hmm. I see adopted that and developed uh, seven steps for more just everyday life um, to carry on uh, all the time. And this is kind of how evangelism can become more of a lifestyle than just a mm-hmm. kind of a one week emphasis. Absolutely. Uh, and so what our churches do that are part of our partnerships is they commit to at least several months. Some of them do it for a whole year at first, praying for those people investing in those relationships, telling them that they're praying for them uh, and setting up a home visit to go and intentionally share the gospel with them and make an invitation for them to follow Christ. And that's the point at which the end-to-end partnerships happen or we have a team from the U.S. come on an international partnership. That's what we're doing that week. That's the week of these Mm -hmm. set up home visits where we go and share the gospel. 
Uh, and that's the model. And that's something they can just take and repeat yeah. and multiply. But of course, sometimes God just does whatever he's going to do mm -hmm. when we're there. Uh, and you never know. Yeah. 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 One yeah. thing that was really cool was, I mean, you kind of mentioned this earlier, but when we were leaving, just that the way that they were so motivated, because like, like we gave them the Avanja cubes and they were so thankful for that. And they thought that was such a cool um, tool to use. <clears throat> and so, yeah, just seeing how motivated they were after they were like, they, they were telling us how ready they were and how they didn't really think the, she was, uh, it was the preacher's wife. And she's like, we never really thought to just like go out on the streets and share right. Jesus. And so, um, they were, they were so motivated after and it was Yay. so cool. So, yeah. They were, they were ready. So, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Hope they're still keeping up that motivation today. Yeah. And hope and pray yeah. that they're doing that. Yeah. All right. All right, well, let's move on to what God has done through International Commission so far this year. So at the time of this recording, it's the end of August. Mm -hmm. um, so we are eight full months into the year, have a few months left. But so far, we have done 10 international partnerships. Again, 10 of those short-term mission trips where we send Americans. We've done 178 national-to-national -national partnerships, reaching 84 countries. So we've worked in 84 countries so far this year, and our team at International Commission, we have a devotional meeting a couple times a week, and we pray over every single country that we are working in that week. And the list is long, it's and it's big. amazing. <laughs> yeah, we literally pray over every country that we're working in that week. So 84 countries reached so far, 178 and 2 end partnerships. 10 international partnerships have taken place, 48,482 global participants. Now, how many people have heard the gospel so far this year? How about, let, I want to hear from you, Chloe. How many do you think so far? Take a guess. Oh, gosh. It was, what was the last number, like in the millions or something? Yeah, so last year, all of last year was 6.8 million. So how far, being eight months into this year, do you think have heard the gospel? I want to like say more than that, but um, maybe I'll say like somewhere around 5 million. Okay. That's what I'm asking. I should know this stat, but I don't um, because I look at things and then forget them. So this is great. This will be a legitimate uh, guess. I will say, what did you say? 5 million? Did yeah, say? I said 5 okay. million. I don't know. Knowing, knowing how the reports come in. Like we'll get a whole bunch of them at the end of the year from a certain part of the world. And so I'm going to say 700,000. Okay. Gosh, hey. I really shot up there. <laughs> hey, hey, those are good guesses. So, so far, 2,401,925 oh. people have heard the gospel. Wow. <laughs> wow. So I was in the millions. You said 5 million, but you said around yeah. 700,000. So yeah, two four. 2.4 million people have heard the gospel so far this year. Of those 2.4 million, how many people do you think have made professions of faith who've accepted Christ? Half of that. I'm going to say like half of it. Like, I'm not. I was going to. I was going to two. So, around a million, 1.2 million. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll just do a flat million then. All right. <laughs> It's a little less than that. It's six hundred sixty-four thousand three hundred twenty-one. Okay, so my so my heard answer was really close. To yeah, the salvation. Okay. <laughs> that's All right. right. That's right. So six hundred sixty-four thousand three hundred twenty-one people have indicated that they have accepted Christ. Praise God! Amazing, amazing. Um, of those six hundred sixty-four thousand, we've had eighty-six thousand six hundred thirty-three baptisms. And new churches, 14,160. Wow. That's amazing. That so far lot. this year, 14,000 new churches. Oh my gosh. Praise God. That's so cool. So cool. I feel like we could do a whole other episode just on this information. Um, you know, like I said earlier, the new churches, the baptisms, talk more about our end to end partnerships and our global participants. Like so many people are involved in this ministry that you 
would not know because we are a seemingly small, not known organization, but God is doing great things. We're so grateful to be a part of it. And some parts of the world that benefits us, that's kind of a funny a thing that we kind of that we kind of uh, juggle sometimes is, uh, of course, here in the U.S. we work to introduce more people to us and to our missions opportunities because, of course, we want to do more and we want to reach more people. But at the same time, globally, uh, it really helps us sometimes that we're not that known because some creative access countries that we're trying to work in, mm-hmm. if people know our name, that might hinder that. And so it's kind of funny how God even uses that. Yeah. To to further what he's doing through us yeah. through our ministry some yeah. places yeah i'd love people to know more about how the networks of leadership work throughout the world mm-hmm. um because it, it's not just the handful of us here at the office or in the u.s it's mm-hmm. really the bulk of it is all these people around the world yeah i always like telling people when they pray for our organization when they pray for our ministry when they go with us when they give to us they are literally having an impact on the kingdom here on earth. Like we could not do any of this without the prayer support, without the financial support, without the American missionaries like you, Chloe, going and our international participants and volunteers. Like every single person is playing such a big role in expanding the kingdom here. And we're so grateful. Um, And it's just such an honor to invite people into that, to invite people and encourage people to go with us and to pray for us and to please give to us because it's so important. And it's just making such a huge impact on the kingdom, as you know now. Yeah, Yeah, and before I went, I wasn't, I didn't know much about IC. And then um, I went and I was with Gary and um, Laverne. I don't know. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Superstar. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So she, so I got to learn more about it and I loved her. She was so sweet, but yeah. Do you know that she's been a part of this organization since pretty much the very beginning? Yes. Very yeah. Beginning. Because she did one of, she did, I think the last day of like our little devotional with all the American missionaries and she like kind of went and told us some stories and yeah, she told us a, one of the beginning stories. Yeah. She's yeah. been here the whole time. She's still she's going. So awesome. yeah. yeah, she is amazing. Yeah. And then Gary, he serves with our organization. He's one of our trip leaders, um, mobilizers. He's He's been around a while. So, yeah, yeah he knows how it works. He's he a great leader to have on the field. What yeah. was, I'm going to go back to your experience since we're on that now. Mm-hmm. What was your absolute favorite thing about this trip? Um, so my favorite thing was, it's kind of hard to choose because I have like so many, but, um, favorite thing was just seeing the faces and the reactions after we pray with them. It was so cool to see the joy on their face. And we like one, there was one group of, there's a group of women that we talked to. And after we shared with them. Um, I was with two of the kids and they actually received Jesus as well, but I heard to the side and one of them was like, yelled, I'm free, I'm free. And so that was so cool. Yeah. I've never experienced like anyone say that after. So that was so cool. And then another thing that I really liked were the kids. They were so sweet and like just, I, we had, um, toys and small things to give to them when we saw like kids or a group of kids. And so, um, I had bracelets and stickers and so I would go and give it to them and they were so happy just to get like a sticker on their hand and then they would run and go get their friends and they'd all come back. And, um, so that was so cool. But yeah. I like to give out little Frisbees. I I love Frisbees. It's a, it's a whole thing, but, (laughs) uh, like little bitty Frisbees, like, uh, you know, y'all can't see this, uh, but I don't know what size of that would be like, but anyway, well, the cheap ones and I'll just buy them in bulk and I'll take those and I'll give That's those cool. to kids because when I started this, I thought, what? well, actually, so what inspired me to do this were a couple of things. One, I just really like Frisbees. I think they're a really simple toy to, to pick up and learn. It doesn't require any verbal communication to throw a Frisbee with someone. So it's a good intercultural kind of connect connector. 
And Dwayne Hartley is a guy that goes on a lot of our partnerships and, and he's been staying behind uh, after some of those to help teach people uh, more discipleship methods and things like that. One of his biggest connection things is, uh, is a Frisbee. And so I, I put those two things cool. together. I thought, I'm just going to always do that. I'm going to take Frisbees uh, all over the world because anybody anywhere knows what it is. Mm. So I'll be able to connect with them. I'm not really good at soccer. I'm mm -hmm. everywhere you go in the world, all the kids want to play soccer. And I'll do it sometimes, but <laughs> yeah. like terrible. So I want to be on the team. And it's like, well, this is actually counterproductive. <laughs> but uh, Frisbees, anybody can do that. So I thought. And this went well dozens of countries this went well proved to be true but i was in uh, central asia i was in a stan country and those kids had no idea what i was throwing at them <laughs> oh, they're like why are you throwing something at me? Yeah, I was like why did you throw that at me and so like I just, <laughs> I just like threw it and it would go boop hit their chest and fall and they're like why would you do that i was like oh no now i'm hurting these kids feelings instead of like, no, no, it's a game. Yeah, no, it's supposed to be fun. And so I would like motion, you know, throw it, throw it. They didn't know what was going on. So, oh, yeah. well, where was this? You said uh, it was a, it was a stand country in Central oh. Asia. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, it just, I don't know. I guess the culture is so different there that Frisbees haven't made it. I don't know. Or they're just not popular. Yeah. Boy, I really went down a rabbit trail on that one. But that's, okay, Chloe, what was your least favorite? You gotta, it's it's time to be honest here. What was your least favorite part of the trip? Maybe it was a cultural challenge. Maybe it was, I don't know, a schedule thing, food thing, whatever. I guess it would have to be food. Um, I, another one would also, I, I'm not a person that gets nervous, to be honest. Like, I'm, and if I do, I don't show it. I don't like to show it. And so being, I was very vulnerable this trip and very, cause I, I mean, I, it was a new experience. I new culture, new people, or, I mean, I had the people from my church, but everyone else I had just met. And so, uh, just being the fact that I was just so vulnerable and nervous all a lot was, mm -hmm. uh, I was not a fan of that, but it also humbled me. But the people that I was around, they even though I I didn't know most of them, they were amazing. They were so amazing. And even like I met my partner that I ended up having that week, and then um, another one of the American missionaries at the airport because all three of us were kind of later on agreeing to the trip and. So we traveled together and meeting them. They were so nice and so sweet and welcoming. And yeah, they were amazing. Awesome. Did you work through a translator? Our national missionary, he translated some. Of, it was mainly our pastors. Um, we They translated some, but we. it was most of the people there spoke English, though. So it wasn't. It wasn't too bad. And then even if they didn't, I did. That was the first time I spoke with the translator. So I had to learn how to do that. I try to speak a lot. And then, and I'm like, no, you gotta, you gotta speak a little and give them time. So that, that is really an unspoken learning curve when it comes to going to another country, because yeah, we're just not used to thinking, okay, after every sentence or every small thought, I need to stop to have them translate. If you're not thinking that way, trans, you know, you keep talking and then translators are like, oh, like, yeah. oh gosh, I got <laughs> that was just a lot that I have to translate now. A skill yeah. I've developed even recently. And man, I mean, that's almost embarrassing to say because I've, just, you know, traveled so much. But uh, after talking with some uh, translators and then explaining kind of what's going on in their mind and what their brain is doing, I've learned a better cadence sort of for how, how to stop and speak. And that is um, a lot of translators have asked, please finish a thought mm. before going on to the next one. So of course, don't speak a big, long sentence. You need, you need to speak a short enough sentence that they can translate that, but don't stop in the middle of a thought because that can affect 
the translation. Yeah. Because English just works differently yeah. from other languages and will split uh, clauses in the middle that kind of depend on the other ones and True. Uh, and it can mess up the meaning of it and they have to go back and correct it. So, but that, again, that's just a skill that comes mm. uh, eventually when you kind of learn it. But Yeah. The, I, I spoke or I said my uh, testimony at church on Sunday. And that was like the first day that we went out and um, did something. And so Sunday we went to church and I did my testimony and I had the translator and he, my partner preached that Sunday. And so he also, and then after we, um, we told him, we were like, yeah, good job. And he was like, yeah, that was the first time I'd ever done anything like that or mm -hmm. ever translated. And I was like, wow. I was like, well, you did good. And so, yeah, he was like, that was the first time I was like, oh, wow. So, which you could, there was some things where we, he, he didn't really get what we were saying. So we had to reword what we were saying. So he was able to know. And so he could translate it, but yeah, I thought that was cool. That happens a lot too. Yeah. So you gotta be ready for that. Think mm -hmm. you're, oh, I've gotta, I've gotta rephrase this if they don't understand what I meant. Yeah, we've done whole conversations about working with translators. It's uh, there's so much to know about that, but uh, don't let that stop you. Yeah, you know, like Chloe went and she was brave and she she did the thing Ooh. and she was out there to serve the Lord and share the gospel. And you know what? God used it. He, he filled in all those gaps. He, yeah, God works. It's really, it really has nothing to do with our skill or experience at all. Just whether we are willing to go or not. So Chloe, from wanting to go on this trip to finding that you wanted to go to the Zimbabwe, what was the, how did you get, how did you get from wanting to go to being on this team and getting on the airplane? It was mainly through my church because I, uh, and I talked to my uh, pastor, right? The Sunday I heard about it, I was like, I looked at my parents and I was like, I want to go to that. And so, and so um, I talked to him and was like, hey, I'm interested. And he helped me kind of sign up and all that. And so um, I got that and then I was I actually a little, I it got closer and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to go because of the money situation. And so, um, I was actually at, in Florida for vacation and Gary called me and I talked to him and I was like, yeah, I'm kind of nervous. And, uh, he was telling me different ideas for that. And so I literally the next day, like all the money was in and I was wow. ready to go and I was fully going. So, um, and then I was super excited the whole time. And then it was my last flight to Zimbabwe. So I had like four and oh boy. yeah, the one right before the last one was like 13 hours. And so this we'll last edit that out. Y'all don't need to know that. <laughs> we don't put that in the brochure. <laughs> oh. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, that's when I, it hit me and I was like, oh my gosh, you're across the world right now, away from your family. And um, so then I started, that's when I started getting a little nervous. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but yeah, and then it worked out. So yeah. It all worked out. It always does. So it goes to show you if you have the desire to go, you're answering the call that the Lord has already given all of us mm -hmm. to make disciples of all nations. Mm -hmm. uh, don't let any fears or nervousness or even doubts about the mm -hmm. cost or the travel, don't let any of that stop you. Because um, you've just heard stories here of how somebody went from a small town in Texas who'd never left the U.S. Mm -hmm. to a crazy, crazy place, crazy far away. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. To do a crazy thing like talking to a bunch of strangers about Jesus and look how God moved. So yeah. you can do it. Go to our website, internationalcommission.org. Uh, click on go and you can see our schedule there. Pray about it. Look at that list. Sign up to go. Just do that. Take that first step. Sign up to go uh, and watch God provide and lead you uh, and give you everything you need to go and then watch him watch him work mm -hmm. grow your in faith. your life on the field grow your faith give you confidence to come back here and share the gospel at home that's what yeah. that's what we love that's what it's all about mm -hmm. on our side you can also see opportunities to pray strategically for international commission mm -hmm. pray with us 
We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for joining us. Share it with your friends. Bye.